Um, as usual, those of you who know me or you'll know from ELF, we've got lots of slides um, and we'll see how we get on with those. I don't want to um, make the slides drive us, but the questions that arise. So, But we are thinking about confidence in Christ and proclaiming the unique Jesus in Century 21. And whatever way you look at it, Christianity is unique in the world. Um, we, we shouldn't forget that. Yes, we might look from a European perspective and see Christianity in decline numerically, the influence of Christianity under threat. But in terms of the global picture, we are talking about a third of the world's population who in some sense, at some level, identify as Christian. We would want to ask all sorts of questions about what they mean by that and, and so on. But that's still a remarkable figure in terms of presence and influence. We also have that uniquely historical source, the 66 books of the Bible. So Peter has helped us think a little bit about that. And um, yes, we're not out to to uh, undermine and diss the, the Quran or uh, the, the, the Vedas of, of Hinduism or the, the texts that claim to be the teaching of the Buddha. But we do have this book that has had an unparalleled influence on world thinking and on the lives of people globally. And that stands up to comparison. We also have, an un, as I've mentioned off the back of that, an unparalleled influence on global values. Of course, because of the influence of Europe that was so influenced by Christian values. But in terms of human rights, in terms of standards of ethics, it's easy in the Western world to look at that and say, Christian values are being undermined. In my context in Northern Ireland, we've recently had radical changes to the law around abortion and marriage that, yes, are turning away from Christian values. But there are also many, many things in our legal system that continue to bear the influence of Christianity. And we should be confident to say these things came from Christianity. The idea that every individual has value is a, is a distinctively and profoundly Christian idea. The idea that, that there should be a quality of value between people again, is a Christian idea, even if some of the ways it is applied go wrong. The idea of compassion, um, I think it was said in the introduction to one of the plenaries, or maybe during one of them, about uh, the profoundly Christian way that our nations have responded to COVID. I think that can be debated because it's hard to know how much of it is about protecting public finance and systems and healthcare systems, how much of it is making sure politicians don't get the rap if those things collapse under the pressure of numbers, but at the same time, protection of the vulnerable was a big part, at least, of how it was presented to us, and that's a Christian value. Uh, we could also think about the unique view of God that we have. Uh, Trinitarianism, the belief of one God in three persons, is a radically distinctive Christian belief. But the reason we believe that as Christians is because of Jesus. It's because of the person of Jesus. We couldn't have seen God that way or understood God that way if it hadn't been for how Jesus talked about his father and about himself and about the spirit who would come after him. And so it is to the person of Jesus that we really need to look. And I said it at the end of my message yesterday uh, when we were thinking about conversational apologetics and we were linking 1 Peter 3 to Isaiah chapter 8. And I think Isaiah 8 was read again in the introduction to one of the plenaries. And interesting how the Lord brings these things together. Um, but Jesus is the one who is a sanctuary and a stone of offense. He's the one who causes people to stumble. And he's the one on whom people build a sure foundation for their life and find a cornerstone. And we shouldn't ever try to avoid that. In fact, our job as apologists is not to remove the offense of Jesus, but to reveal that offense, if you like, in the same way, as Peter said, we're clearing the way for people to engage with the Bible. But how they engage with it will depend on their response and what God is doing in their life. That's not ours to control. The problem we have is that there are so many other things that cause offense which shouldn't, okay, and, and we've got to strip behind those uh, and explain those and remove those barriers so that people come face to face with Jesus. And that isn't always going to be popular 
It's not going to mean necessarily there will be revival in your country. That's in the Lord's hands, but it is the task to which we are called. What we need to do then is keep Jesus central. John Stackhouse, uh, it's a book I would recommend, Humble Apologetics. I love the title because I think apologetics, as we've said before, it isn't always humble. Uh, and he says some really helpful things. But one of those is apologists will want to focus upon the claims Christians have made about Jesus rather than abstractions about religion, theism, or even Christianity. The particular claims about Jesus lie at the heart of the matter. In other words, your job is not to make theists you know, convince people that there is a God. It's not even to make biblicists, if that's a word, people will say, yeah, the Bible is worth reading and, and trustworthy. It is to introduce them to Jesus. And, and that's, that's our goal. So what is it that we claim about Jesus? Who is he? What misunderstandings of him are there? How do we strip those away? Uh, C.S. Lewis, who's another kind of fan of mine, he came from our part of the world, uh, John and my part of the world, and although he did go over to England for most of his time, but we'll claim him anyway. Um, but, but one of his famous sayings is, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. John started us off at the beginning of the, the week on Sunday thinking about worldview. And the illuminating power of Christianity or of the gospel to illuminate every issue, to give us a coherent understanding of life, of the paradoxes of life even, the paradoxes of why can human beings be so good and compassionate and why can we be so bad. It's a great paradox that other worldviews struggle to explain. They usually fall down because either they say we're just good, if we could just educate everybody and you know whatever every everyone would be good well that's not true or everybody is just bad and there's nothing good well that's also not true but christianity explains because of creation and fall if i want to distort what or not distort but narrow what, what lewis has said maybe i would want to say i believe in christ as i believe the sun has risen not only because i see him but because by him, I see everything else. And that's really, I suppose, what I'm trying to say in this time that we have. We need to keep Christ central. Another author, Benno van de Torren, South African author about apologetics, says, we will, in the final analysis, only be able to persuade our dialogue partner because of the persuasive power of the person and message of Jesus Christ and the window he opens on our world and condition as a whole. We need to keep both elements in view and in balance, Jesus Christ and the whole of our experience. Jesus Christ is central because we believe that in him, God and the nature and destiny of his creation are revealed because the new perspective we gain in Christ illuminates our world and lives and the whole of our experience. That's Lewis's point. We can subsequently present it confidently to those who point to other clues. So seeing things through the lens of Jesus makes more sense of the world than any alternative worldview. But the person of Jesus himself is compelling in and of himself as well. When people read about him and listen to him and see him, even with the paradoxes of John, he, he either, he provokes a response. You can't sit idly and say, oh, well, he's not interesting. If, he, if you think he's not interesting, you haven't read anything he said. You haven't listened to the stories about him. You haven't seen that. You, you can't say he's not provocative. You can't take him as something light to be thrown away um, lightly. Have a look at those questions on the screen. How can you believe God exists? Why does God leave evil unpunished or allow such suffering? Or does God care about it? Why do you trust the Bible? How can Christians think their religion is the only right one? Is blank, whatever it is, sinful? Um, is God anti-gay? That's probably the usual one. Is homosexual activity sinful? Is God anti-gay? Or whatever, is whatever sinful? How could a good God send people to hell? Now think about those questions and ask yourself, what difference would it make if you put Jesus into the question? Let, let, let me kind of suggest, look at the difference. How can you believe God exists? 
well, what did Jesus claim to be God mean? And is it credible? It's kind of the same question, isn't it? But it's a different question and it's an important difference. I mean, it gets you into questions like, did Jesus exist? And do we know what he said and did? And all of those questions. But, but you see how you're reframing the question. Why does God leave evil unpunished? Well, how could God enter into our world of suffering in the person of Jesus? And what does Jesus' suffering say about us? That kind of does two things. It, you, you can't imagine God as someone who is distant and uninvolved when you look at Jesus or who is uncaring and unaffected by our suffering, can you? You can't say that. You could say that about some abstract concept of God. You can't say it about Jesus. And what does his suffering say about us? Doesn't that expose the depth of human sin, of depravity, of just how evil we could be to put to death someone so innocent? What does that say about us? Why do you trust the Bible? Can we trust Jesus or maybe can we believe Jesus when he said that we should trust the Bible? Because for us as Christians, that's the bottom line, isn't it? Jesus, okay, admittedly, we're reading that in the Bible. So you could say that's circular. We've still got to have our arguments for why the text is trustworthy, why it's a faithful record of the, the Jesus who lived and spoke, and we can do that. But then we're confronted with the fact that Jesus upheld it, even the uncomfortable bits. So how do we handle that? How can Christians think their religion is the only right one? Well, how could Jesus claim to be the only truth and way to God? We're dealing not with my opinion about my religion, which is, of course, what people think you're saying. You're trying to impose your morality, your beliefs, your religion onto me. Well, no, I have to say, no, you know what? I, I don't want to do that. I'd be afraid if that's really what I was doing. But, but let me tell you about what Jesus said, and I trust him. I have a Lord, to go back to First Peter 3. He's the Lord. Uh, and actually, I believe he knows better than me. That brings humility, and it puts the focus onto him. Is such and such sinful? Well, what did Jesus say and do about sin? And say and do so that he did talk about sin, but he also talked about a, a solution to the problem of sin, didn't he? And he did something about that. Is God anti-gay? Well, is Jesus anti-gay? What would that mean? How did Jesus treat people? I find it really helpful to look at the rich young ruler, particularly in Mark's account of that, where Jesus, it says, looked at him and loved him. And I sometimes think, well, the next statement in our culture should be, so Jesus just gave him a big hug and said, it's all right, son, come on, you're in the family and uh, let's not bother about the issues you have. Now, that man's issue was not sexuality. It was, it was wealth, wasn't it? And the love of money. And what did Jesus say to him? Go and sell everything and follow me. A standard that Jesus didn't call other people to but did call that man to because that was the idol of his heart. So here is the Jesus who loves people, but who sets a standard and a threshold to say, look, if you're going to come to me, you've got to give up the things that are your gods, your false gods. How could a good God send people to hell? Well, what did Jesus say about hell? He said a lot about it. Now, I'm not saying that by bringing Jesus into it, you get an easy answer to the question, but you find yourself on the territory that you would rather be on, wouldn't you? You'd rather leave people with a, a thought about Jesus than with a thought about you or a thought about God in the abstract. But the other thing with this is Jesus reframes our attitude, which is really what I said in 1 Peter 3. I have a Lord, and that gives me confidence and humility, right? So keeping Jesus at the center changes the conversation, and it's helpful because you know that many, many people still have a positive view of Jesus, whether it's Muslims who regard him as a prophet or post-Christian Europeans who still sort of think, yeah, it's the church that's bad. Jesus was probably a good guy, but the church kind of distorted that and messed it up. Or he was a good man and an interesting teacher, but he wasn't God like you claim. Well, what did he say about that? But, but bringing, so that's really helpful because you get a point of entrance that it's harder for people to say Jesus was bad than it is for them to say you are bad. But you also keep the right attitude by keeping Jesus at the center of humility and boldness. Now, we could say a lot about the uniqueness of Christ and time isn't going to let us do that. 
But I find it really helpful to compare him with other major world religious leaders. So take Muhammad and the Buddha as examples. A few years ago, there was a, a man who wrote a book um, where he was trying to list the most influential people from uh, the past two millennium or, or in history, maybe I think it was, it must have been because Jesus was in there and that's two millennia. Um, and, and so the most influential people in history, number one, he said, Muhammad. Number two, Jesus. And the reason he gave for Muhammad being higher than Jesus was because Muhammad was not just a religious teacher and leader, but a general and a, and a ruler. OK, so Muhammad kind of ticked several of his boxes for what made a great person. Of course, from a Christian point of view, you turn that around and say, well, actually, it's the fact that Jesus had such influence, even though he had no status in the world, that makes him all the more remarkable. We don't have to trade off numbers and say there are more Christians than Muslims, although there are and there will be for some time to come, if not uh, indefinitely, the idea that Islam will overtake Christianity, I think, is bad statistics, at least in, in the foreseeable future. That's not the point, though. It's not a battle about numbers. But looking at the person, Jesus is born in poverty. Muhammad might have been an orphan from a young age. The Buddha was born in wealth and abandoned it to seek his own enlightenment. But Muhammad, even though he was an orphan, potentially, uh, was in a, an influential clan within the Arab world uh, and in a merchant family. Jesus is born in poverty. He shuns power. Unlike Muhammad, the Buddha shunned power, yes. But the Buddha died an old man, possibly of food poisoning. Muhammad died as an older man as well. And, and yet Jesus, his, his death was rejected. He's, he's on the fringes throughout his life. Uh, so he's an intriguing fig figure at the very least. But his teaching is also unique. He, he fulfilled the Old Testament. Let me say some of the ways his ethics was, was unique. People sometimes say the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is something that's found across religions. But as far as I can see, and I've tried to look into the history of it, there is a version of it that goes back to various pe people like Confucius in China um, and other philosophers who said, do to other people as you would have them do to you. Or do to other people, yeah, as you would have them do, or sorry, they say don't do to other people as you wouldn't want them to do to you. That's the way they put it, the negative form. Right. In other words, don't do any harm to anybody else. Don't interfere in other people's lives. Get on with your life. Let them get on with theirs. Make sure they have space to flourish as you flourish. Don't, you know, infringe. That's very much our culture today, isn't it? Live your own way as long as you don't harm anybody else. But what does Jesus do? He ranks it up to a much higher level and he says you must do to others what you would have them do to you positively go out of your way to do good to other people not because they have done good to you but because it's what you would like them to do to you some philosophers have actually even said that's crazy it's impossible it's far too high a standard yep it is we're on to something here aren't we so how can jesus demand something impossible of his followers well that's going to lead you into what jesus said about sin and redemption and the coming power of the spirit isn't it we're, we're on to a point where we can see a difference between ethics. Um, his backstory, don't forget that. Jesus wasn't just claiming to be God, as in the way a few years ago a British guy called David Icke said, I am God, a new agey kind of thinking, you know, because he was convinced that he had such enlightenment that he was a God or divine. But Jesus is talking about being the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I think this has been really helpful that recently we've got a better understanding of the narrative of scripture and of the gospel as a fulfillment of that whole narrative from the promises to Abraham. Because when we narrow it down, as we did in a Christianized world where people were familiar with God and believed he existed, we could assume all of that. They knew they were sinners. They just needed to get right with God through Jesus. 
But now people don't know that and we have to start further back, don't we? And we have to show, you know, it's not just, I'm not just asking you to believe in a man who lived 2000 years ago, but a man whose identity and story was the fulfillment of something that goes right back as far as recorded history. Uh, and who, who was a, a, a fulfillment of, of truth that goes back further. And then, of course, the heart of the matter, what did Jesus say about sin and about his great theme of entering the kingdom of God? Well, he made it all about himself, didn't he? There's the exclusive claim of Jesus. It's If you're going to be in God's kingdom, you've got to build your life on my words. We could look at Jesus' actions, his miracles. Um, so the passage we were looking at with Stefan yesterday, again, we saw the Old Testament bears testimony to him. We should not forget, Peter reminded us today as well, the fulfillment of prophecy and so on, but also the actions of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. They mightn't be the first go-to place, but they're part of it, aren't they? And, and not just his mighty miracles, but also his actions of identifying with and associating with the marginalized really important in a world that is so caught up with liberation and the idea of oppressed groups jesus certainly wasn't an oppressor it was the people in power that he spoke against but he still called the oppressed to truth he found it possible to talk about sin in their lives too without shunning them then there are the claims of jesus to be God. Was he God? Well, we have his credible claim. Can't go into that, but Stefan helped us with that yesterday. And he claimed it numerous times and he demonstrated the authority of God and he accepted worship as God. And Christians have claimed it from the very beginning. It's in the Gospels, it's in the epistles, including in 1 Peter 3, indirectly in the way that I showed you. It's in Revelation and it's in the early creeds of the church. It was a core confession for them. But that's a profound truth that God came down, the old picture of roads leading up the mountain to God. Well, no, God came down the mountain in the person of Jesus. An incarnation is a distinctively Christian truth. Sometimes you'll hear people saying, oh, it's, it's based on earlier myths and legends. And you've got incarnations in Hinduism, Krishna, um, and, uh, and so on being an incarnation of the Hindu gods. You've got Zeus coming down. Usually it seems to impregnate some, some woman and leave behind a demigod uh, as his son. But the Christian belief in incarnation is not the same. It is not the same as any of these things for three reasons. Jesus is fully God. Fully God. He's not a, an aspect of creation deified or, or one of the gods or one manifestation of God or one aspect of God, the way the Hindu gods are or the way Zeus was and the other gods of the ancient world. He is fully God and he is fully man. He doesn't come down to play around or to kind of walk around in an aura with uh, blue skin, the way the Hindu gods are personified, or, you know, kind of just to have a bit of lust, uh, fulfillment of his lusts like Zeus. He's fully God, man in every respect. And most significantly and profoundly, and I can't fathom this, but it is a permanent union. Jesus remains God and man today. And that is a permanent union restoring manhood or humanity into relationship with God. When Jesus returns in glory, he will be human. Uh, and that's profound. This is not playing around. It's a permanent union. So if our culture is looking for deity in man, deifying ourselves in the postmodern culture, identity in yourself, where is the truly deified man well it's not a deified man it's a manified deity isn't it god become flesh who shows us what true humanity is and who god truly is and how we can come to know god through him we could think about his death again so different than muhammad or the buddha and and his claim that he died for the sins of others and of course we could think about his resurrection which for the new testament was the key apologetic argument and if you haven't got that, get a good set of arguments. There's lots of great resources to help you with that about the resurrection. Because I think, yes, it may not be popular as it wasn't in Acts. As soon as they heard about the resurrection, don't want to hear you anymore. Most of them said. But some said. And the resurrection being important because it's the reminder that actually 
this idea that we have now in the postmodern world of the inner self being the real self, the new Gnosticism, the body is unimportant, so modify it and change it if it doesn't fit with your sense of identity. But resurrection tells us body matters, physical stuff matters, you matter, individuality matters, creation matters. There's your connection with climate care and eco-warriors. And we see it, don't we, in its fullness in Jesus.